Welcome to everybody that has joined us today. Um, if you're new to uh, the CW webinar series, welcome. If you've been here before, thanks for coming back. Um, and uh, it's a little bit of a bittersweet moment today because this is the final virtual meeting that we're going to be hosting through CW. Um, but have no fear, we're going to continue to do these virtual webinars under a new program called COBRA, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But um, I want to start with just like reminiscing uh, at how, how wonderful this UW community has been over the past 10 years, um, uh, getting together to think about life in the subsurface of the ocean, as well as in the subsurface on land, and all the crazy microbes that live down there, and the important chemical reactions that happen in the bottom of the ocean. This program has really brought together an international community, and I am sure we will stay connected, um, even though CW is sunsetting. Uh, the, where we go, the expertise that we have brought together through CW um, shouldn't fall away because it's urgently needed <laughs> to inform new emerging uses of deep sea, um, especially related to the rocky parts of the deep sea. And that is what has led to the initiation of this new program called COBRA. Um, and so for any of you who are new uh, to Sea Debbie and don't even know like what the deep ocean is, um, that's fine. Welcome. You're, we're excited you're here today to learn about Anvio. Um, but if you think about the deep sea, um, there are these environments where rocky uh, habitat on the seafloor supports crazy animals and um, microbes, but there are industrial interests in the deep sea in potentially removing some of these rocks for the minerals that they contain, or uh, maybe using the deep sea as a repository for carbon dioxide uh, to address uh, global warming. Uh, both of those things urgently need scientists to be part of those conversations and think about how those actions might disturb the environments, how the environments might recover, what the chemical um, ramifications are of those things. Um, and so that's why COBRA started. Um, so COBRA is a new research um, coordination network with a mission to try to accelerate the research on these types of topics so that we can inform decision making. Um, and we're going to do that in a variety of different ways. I'm not going to go into that in detail here, but I encourage you to go to the COBRA website, which is at cobra.bigelow.org. And one of the things that we want to do there is help with coordination and sharing knowledge and training people um, about how to interact with policymakers, for example. And so we'll do that with a new uh, webinar series that we'll launch in the next few months. So please stay tuned. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to sign up for the newsletter for COBRA. So if you've got a phone handy, you can scan the QR code there. You can go to the website. You can ask the people who are listed here who are part of the leadership team. Um, have no fear, Jim McManus is still with us. Um, he's just no longer part of the uh, organizing team because he's about to transition to a role at the National Science Foundation. Um, but we'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Um, and this is what it looks like. So just go to the COBRA webpage and sign up for the newsletter and you will stay connected. And we'll obviously put this in the CW newsletter as well. So everybody knows. So the webinars will continue. They'll just be under a different moniker. All right, with that, thank you so much for everybody that's been part of CW and especially thank you to Joy and James and Sejad and Rosalind for helping organize these webinars over the last year or so. Um, it's really been a great experience to work with this team. Um, so thankful for that. And thankful for all of you, especially the new folks who are still showing up. That's great. Okay, with that, I will hand it over to Joy um, to go over today's code of conduct. Awesome. Thank you so much, Beth. All right, just to dive into our code of conduct here, um, even though this is a virtual space, we're going to treat it just as a normal space in person. So please, everybody treat each other with dignity and respect, communicate with civility. We might have lots of um, opinions and we should, right? This is an exciting topic, um, but still treat everyone with respect, um, both in the chat and verbally. The following behaviors are prohibited. Please, no harassments or threats in any form. Any behavior that has the effect of creating an environment that is hostile towards a person or group is prohibited. Um, and then usually taking videos or photos without prior consent is prohibited. However, today at Eva's request, we are recording our seminar today. So um, we'll have access to the content 
content that she graciously shares with us. Uh, the consequence of these behaviors, we're going to kick you out of the meeting and bar you from attending future meetings. If you suspect any of this prohibited behavior is occurring, please report it to either Beth, Rosalind, myself, or Sajad. Our contact info is there in the chat. And if you would like to read the full code of conduct, please access the link that was provided in the chat for you as well. Awesome. And then, okay, I'll be agenda plan. So if this is your first time with us, we have an exciting lineup of activities. Um, so here's our little intro bit. In just a couple of minutes, we're going to do breakout rooms. So we'll get to know each other a little bit more, get to know our um, uh, ways that we interface with bioinformatics, what really we're here for. And then we'll come back to a plenary talk by Eva after an introduction. And then we'll have a, a long time for questions and answers, just an open forum about the tool and ways in which we can use this exciting platform. Um, and then just a final send off for the next upcoming events for COBRA. All right. So I think we should get into our rooms or is Sajad gonna I'll, introduce? Yeah, yeah, I'll quickly give an overview on the uh, breakout room. So the uh, idea as Joy was mentioning is uh, because we are a, a big group, so it would be an opportunity to meet uh, in a smaller group and get to know uh, uh, at least some of the participants. Uh, so we have two uh, questions uh, in the breakout room. Uh, so one, uh, basically to introduce yourself uh, and what's your research background. And number two, what's your uh, exposure to bioinformatics? So uh, we'll split into, uh, Rosalind is gonna split us into uh, uh, breakout rooms and then we would have 10 minutes and each breakout room would have about 10 people or so and then we'll uh, reconnect in the main group uh, after that. Yeah, great, get to know each other. <laughs> Here we go, all right. <laughs> Joy, are you ready to kick us off? Absolutely, I'm very excited. All right, so today we have Eva Vaselli. Eva is a PhD student in the biophysical sciences program at the University of Chicago, where she works in the Marin lab. She graduated with her bachelor's degree in biology and her master's degree in computer science from Illinois Institute of Technology in 2018. During her time at Illinois Tech, she developed interdisciplinary experience in biology and computer science to pursue a career in bioinformatics research. Because of her outstanding potential, she was awarded an NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program grant for her work focused on the metabolic potential of microbes from genomic and metagenomic data. She studies metabolic competency in the ocean and gut microbiomes using a variety of computational omic techniques, many of which she is directly developing alongside the rest of Marin's team. Today, Eve is going to expose us to the Onvio platform. If you don't know, Onvio is a comprehensive platform that brings together many aspects of today's cutting edge computational strategies of data enabled microbiology, including most of the things that we work with every day, like genomes, metagenomes, pangenomes, phylogenomic data, and all the rest. So I'm particularly excited to hear about the latest developments that we can leverage for our own bioinformatics research. And so here is Eva talking about the many ways to use Ombio, a platform for microbial omics. Thank you so much. One second, I'm just uh, setting up my screen share right here. Yeah, thank you so much for that lovely inter introduction. Um, I'm really excited to talk about Ambio with all of you today. So um, just one second. All right, uh, I guess I will just get started. So that looks great. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so hi, everyone. Uh, as Joy said in her lovely introduction, I'm Eva, and I'm a grad student in the Marin Lab at the University of Chicago. And today I am going to talk to you about Ambio which, as Joy said, is a software platform for omics data that is developed not only by the Marin Lab, but also a lot of other people in the omics community. And as you can probably tell from the title of this talk, there are a lot of ways to use Ampio, ranging from the basic to the incredibly complex. And my goal today is to give you all some snapshots of how people have used Ampio in their own research and hopefully inspire you with ideas of how to use it with your own data. So some of you have may already heard of Ambio. Uh, I've even heard from a few of you that you've already been using it, which just makes me really excited. 
Um, but just to get everyone on the same page, I'm going to start by telling you a bit about the software itself. And then we're going to get into a lot of examples of how to use it, featuring omics research from many different people, not just from the Marin lab, but also from the, the wider omics community. And for a bit of context before I start, I just wanted to show you the Marin lab as it is today. These are all of our current members, and we're a primarily computational group that are studying microbial omics using a variety of sequencing data types. And the research topics that we have, which you'll see underneath our pictures, uh, those drive a lot of the features that you'll see in Ambio. Without further ado, let's talk about what Ambio actually is. So as I've said, Ambio is the software platform for microbial omics. The AN stands for analysis, the VI stands for visualization, and the apostrophe O stands for omics. And to clarify, an AMBIO is primarily designed for working with prokaryotic genomes and metagenomes, but several people have found ways to study eukaryotes with it too. So if that's your domain of interest, no worries, you can still use this tool if you want to. It is an open source software. So even though its development started in the Marin lab and our lab continues to include its core development team, anyone can add to the software. And we have been getting contributions from lots of other bioinformatics experts for years. We have a very large friendly community online. Um, and these people also contribute to the development of Ampio by finding bugs and suggesting new features and testing the code. And finally, uh, one key feature of Ambio is that it allows you to explore your data interactively. So let me show you what I mean by that. So interactive visualization is usually the first thing that people think of when they hear about Ambio, because the software was actually originally designed for metagenomic binning, which is the process of grouping together metagenomic contigs that come from the same population genome. And this is what you're seeing in the video that's playing on the slide. Binning relies on finding patterns in the context sequence composition and its coverage across samples, which means it's best done when you can look at the data yourself and see those patterns. So the interface was designed to display your contigs in an organized fashion and allow you to bin them interactively. And here in the video, every item on the inner dendrogram in the interface is one context sequence from an assembly, and every concentric layer of the circle is showing the coverage of that contig in one metagenome sample. And since they're organized on the dendrogram by their uh, tetranucleotide frequency and the coverage patterns across samples, you can easily and quickly see the contents that should go together because they're clustered together in the dendrogram. Um, I also want to mention that if you want to use an automated binning algorithm, you can do that. And then you could import those automatically generated bins into Ampio to visualize them and manually curate them. So beyond binning, the interactive interface is generally for exploring your data by clicking around, zooming in, and inspecting things so that you can find cool patterns or insights and then translate those findings directly into a figure that is close to publication ready. All of the figures here on this slide are actually coming originally from the interactive interface. And for a lot of them, they only required a little bit of modification in Inkscape or Illustrator or any other SVG editor to make them look like this. So you'll see a lot more of these uh, examples in the later half of the talk. Over the years, as we've needed more and more capabilities for our own research, and as we've also gotten suggestions and help from researchers outside our own group, Ambio has expanded beyond metagenomics so that it now enables a wide variety of different analyses, most of which start from some sort of sequence data. And to give you a sense of how this platform has expanded and the breadth of people who have worked on it, on this slide, I'm showing a lot of people who have either directly written code for Anvio or who have made significant intellectual contributions to it by offering ideas, finding or fixing bugs, writing documentation, or answering questions on the Anvio Slack channel. And this isn't even all of the contributors. I just couldn't fit any more people onto the slide. Uh, I won't go through everyone, but I do want to point out the people in the middle, Marin and Ozjan who started Ampio with a lot of help from Alone, Marin's first grad student. Those three people are responsible for the core functionality of the platform. And then all around the outside of this mass of people, you can see examples of a few other 
major features of the software, such as protein structure prediction, which is implemented by Evan. Uh, here's Matt's EcoFiler workflow, which is a very recent addition to the Ampio code base. Uh, this is metabolism prediction, which is written by me. And this is Sam's module for tRNA sequence analysis. And finally, I just want to give a huge shout out to Jessica Pan here at the top, who went through a large effort to put together extensive documentation on our website, which all of us use basically every single day. So that was a huge help to the community. So as I've said, Ambio is open source, and that's a big reason why so many people contribute to this platform. A lot of the collaboration on our code, especially bug fixes and feature requests, happens on GitHub, totally open to the public, where we have 46 contributors, contributors so far. Uh, we also have a Slack channel, as I've alluded to before, where anyone can ask each other questions or get advice about using Ambio, and that's where we get a lot of suggestions from the community on how to improve it. And this is also the first, place, the first place to go if you need help using the software. Now, I want to explain a little bit about the structure of Ambio so that you can understand how so many different analysis types can fit into one pl platform. You've already seen the interactive interface for visualizing data, but in fact, most of the analysis work is done by a variety of different command line programs, which can be mixed and matched to fit your data and your research questions. On the slide here, you can see a screenshot of all those programs, but actually this isn't the best way to see how they all work together. It's better just for seeing the volume of them. Uh, it's actually much better to consider these programs as part of a large interconnected network where the output from one program can be input to another program and data analysis can follow a variety of paths through this graph, depending on what you need to do. And this is actually a screenshot from an interactive website on the bottom left, you can see what it looks like when you click on just one program in the network to see its specific inputs and outputs. And if you were to click on one of those inputs and outputs, you would be able to see which programs produce it or use it, which some people find helpful when they want to figure out which programs they need to use. And this large network of programs can be roughly grouped into four major types. The largest group by far it contains programs that each runs one kind of analysis, like a pan genome or a, phylog a phylogenomic tree generation software. There are also programs for visualizing your data interactively, like we saw before. And since Ambio uses SQLite databases to store information, we also have programs for converting your data into an Ambio compatible format, as well as programs for extracting data out of those databases and into common formats like FASTA files, DCF files, or we especially like to use plain text files, tab the limited ones, uh, that can be easily viewed or parsed downstream in case you need to do further analysis outside of Ampio. I have a couple of final points before we move on to examples of how to use Ampio. First, it's a very versatile and powerful software because it's not a linear analysis pipeline, because it allows you to mix and match programs to customize your analysis according to what you need. And that means that Ambio can be difficult to learn. It does have a steep learning curve. And we've heard it can be especially daunting for people with, without a lot of computational experience. However, as a lot of those people have later told us, there is a lot of help available to Ambio users. So I've already mentioned our Slack community where you can ask for advice. And we also have extensive online resources with tutorials and documentation and blog posts. And we even occasionally are able to run workshops on using Ambio. So anyone wanting to use this platform should hopefully not be scared because there's lots of resources and friendly people out there to help you get started. And with that said, I think it's a perfect time to start talking about the different ways of using Ambio. I'm now going to go through a lot of real world examples quite quickly just to showcase to you what people have been able to accomplish with the software. And I'll be skimming over some details, but I'll, I'm happy to discuss these more in depth after the talk. Although most of them are not my work, I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. So let's start with the basics, because even though you can do complex and fancy stuff with Ambio, it doesn't mean you have to. There are simple ways to do straightforward analyses, which can still involve some complicated bioinformatics happening under the hood 
but not necessarily a lot of effort on your part. So a classic example of this is a pangenome, where you analyze occurrence of genes across a set of genomes, often from somewhat closely related species. So here on this slide is a pangenome comparing five Enterococcus specium species, those are the blue ones, with six Enterococcus faecalis species, which are pink. And it only takes three AMBIO commands and about 10 to 20 minutes, depending on your laptop capabilities, to get to this figure. For pangenomes, the figure is a little bit different than for what we saw earlier with, with metagenomic assemblies. Here, each spoke of the wheel is representing one gene cluster, and each concentric circle is representing one genome. And wherever the color is dark, that means that the genome has a gene in the gene cluster. So this space on the figure where all the circles are dark is the core set of gene clusters, so the genes that are present in all of the genomes. And the space where just one color is dark is the accessory genome of a given species. And one last thing I want to mention is that whenever possible for these examples, I've put the link to any tutorials or reproducible workflows in the bottom left corner. So if you want to do a similar analysis, you can check out these links to learn how. For the next example, uh, in omics work, we often need to run a lot of the same steps on many different samples. And to make this easier, Ambio has a program, Ambio Run Workflow, which uses this workflow tool called SnakeBank to automatically run analyses in a high throughput fashion. And this particular example is a graph of all of the programs that are run in our metagenomics workflow, which includes programs for assembly and read mapping back to the assembly's contigs and also gene annotation. I'm only showing two samples here in this graph, but regardless of how many samples you have to process, running this analysis only requires you to set up one configuration file and then run one command. Now I want to show you some examples where people have mixed multiple types of omics analysis in their research projects using Ampule. So first up is the spiroplasma genome from Carl Yeoman. They used 31 spiroplasma genomes, including one metagenome assembled genome, or MAG, that they binned themselves, and then a couple of MAGs from a different paper. And they made this pangenome out of those 31, uh, which let them find this set of single copy core genes, so genes that are present in one copy in every single one of these 31 genomes. And what they were then able to do was use these 89 single copy core genes to produce this phylogenomic tree and put their MAG in context with the publicly available spiroplasma genomes. They also added this heat map of average nucleotide identity using AMBIO as well. And you can see that all the evidence, the heat map, the pangenome, and the phylogeny points to their MAG branching with this other publicly available ent acro 10 MAG. Next, we have a paper from Alon Scheiber and Amy Willis this is their pangenome of 55 TM7 genomes from the human oral cavity. And it shows that TM7 is split into functional and phylogenetic clades according to whether it comes from the tongue or from plaque on teeth. And they also developed, while doing this paper, a statistical analysis uh, which computes which functions are enriched in the different groups of TM7. And this enrichment analysis, which is here on the bottom left, showed that the TUN1 clade, or the T1 group had several of its own unique clade specific variants of genes encoding core functions. Finally, this is from a preprint by Andrea Watson, in which she bin mags from a stool donor in a fecal microbiota transplant study. And she tracked how these populations colonized the stool recipients over time, before and after the fecal transfer. After that, she took her mags and compared the metabolic pathways, which were encoded by the good colonizers and those that were encoded by the bad colonizers. And she figured out that the good colonizers have more complete pathways for biosynthesis of key metabolites like cofactors and vitamins uh, than the, the poor colonizers did. So the next section is going to be our biggest set of examples because I just think a lot of them are so cool. Uh, an Anvio power user combines things not described by our tutorials or standard workflows to produce a completely novel analysis, sometimes even combining data that we never expected 
would could be combined when developing the platform. So first up is this really cool coral reef microbiome study by Maggie Johnson et al, where they combine 60 nest analysis with metagenomics. Ambio really isn't meant for analyzing 60 nest data, but they managed it and it turned into this really cool figure where they showed how the Amblicon sequencing variants match up to the mags that they binned. And as you can see, Marin was so impressed by this figure that he tweeted about it. Here is an analysis from a preprint by Thomas Hackle and Florian Trigaday about Proofframe, which is a software for correcting frame shift errors in long reads. They did this neat little analysis with two similar strains and one slightly different strain of the same Acromancia population. And they used the Anvio pangenomic workflow to show how the analysis improves after correcting the sequences with Proofframe. So you can see that the pan genome gets much less fragmented and the core and accessory genomes are much better delineated after the long read correction. This example is one of the most comprehensive multi-omics analyses that we've ever seen done in Anvio. It was put together by Tom Delmont and Evan Kiefel, who studied SAR-11 populations across the global oceans by combining all these different types of analysis. But in my opinion, the coolest part is the protein structure analysis that Evan did, where he showed the locations of amino acids that are variable across samples overlaid on the 3D structure of each protein. And this is not explicitly shown here, but he also demonstrated that a lot of this variability in these proteins is correlated with the temperature of the ocean where the SAR-11 populations were, were located. And here is another crazy and maybe I can say borderline genius example from Tom Delmont. So if you work with metagenomes, you probably know that 16S genes are not often found in Max because they break metagenome assemblies. But Tom really wanted some 16S genes for his trichodesmium populations. So what he did was he mapped metagenomic short reads to reference trichodesmium genomes. And wherever he had a sample that only had one dominant trichodesmium, he used the single nucleotide variants on the reference 16S gene to basically reconstruct the sequence of the 16S gene for that dominant population in the sample. And then he took those reconstructed sequences and made a phylogeny out of them, which is absolutely incredible in my opinion. This example from Jem and Zhou is impressive, not just because of this pretty rainbow figure, but also because of its scale. They recovered an ancient genome of Salmonella and Terga from an 800-year-old skeleton, and then they compared that, that mag to a lot of other S and Terga genomes, both ancient and modern. This phylogeny at the top is made with almost 3,000 genomes, representing the diversity of about 50,000 Salmonella strains. And then this pan genome on the bottom is made with 222 representatives of this Paris lineage subclade, which is this clade in the, the little red box here, and also the clade that their ancient genome ultimately belonged to. Finally, here is one last example from a review article by Blair Paul and Marin, in which they used Anvio in conjunction with oligotyping to study diversity generating retro elements. If you don't know what those are, diversity generating retro elements, or they're often called DGRs, are hypervariable regions of DNA which microbes use to quickly diversify their proteins. So they're changing very rapidly over time. So what Marin and Blair did was they analyzed the same DGR in trichodesmium populations from six different ocean metagenomes taken at two different locations. And they showed just how diverse these sequences were even in the metagenomes that come from the same place. So regardless of how complex of an analysis you're working on, there's one more way that people can use to take advantage of all Anvio has to offer, and that is working with the development version of the platform. And the development version of Anvio is certainly not for everybody, as our installation page points out. And in fact, most people do stick to the latest stable release of Anvio, which is very well tested and works very well most of the time. But if we add a fancy new feature or we fix a bug, you would have to wait until the next release comes out to see those improvements. Whereas when you, you use the development version of Anvio, you can get all the code updates in real time at the expense of occasionally running into issues that we sometimes introduce while developing. Even better, 
By using the development version, you're doing the community a service because you're helping us test the code and find bugs. And even better than that, you can change the code yourself and add the features that you want to see, or as Marin puts it, hack Anthio. For example, a few months ago, our collaborator Antonio reached out on Slack because he needed a new strategy for estimating metabolism on his ancient DNA samples. He basically needed to be able to give Anthio a list of the enzymes he found in his ancient DNA and get metabolism estimates from that list rather than requiring full gene sequences. So he wrote a bunch of code on his fork of Anvio to let him do this. And then he and I had a few meetings to talk about it and I helped him generalize his code. And eventually it was integrated into the development branch. So now everyone can use it. And these sorts of discussions, which are often on Slack and sometimes on our GitHub, are how a lot of improvements to Anvio start out. So really, if you think of something that you wanna see in Anvio, please do not hesitate to talk to us. That's all for the examples I have to show you today. Some of them have been straightforward and some have been complicated, but what I want everyone to walk away knowing is that all of these analyses are accessible to you. It may take some time and perhaps some more computer work than some of you might be used to, but if you bring your sequencing data and your vision for an analysis, the Anvio community can help you achieve it. We're all connected, as I've said, via the Anvio Slack channel, which is our most valuable resource. And I think you'll find a lot of friendly researchers are there who are happy to help. So I will leave you guys with an analogy that Marin likes to use, which is that Anvio is like a kitchen. Your data are the ingredients that you bring to this kitchen, and Anvio gives you the tools or programs to prepare an analysis, which is the meal in this analogy. So all you need to do is learn how to use the tools, and as you get more proficient in them, you'll find yourself making more complex dishes. You might start out by boiling pasta or baking a frozen pizza, just doing the basic analyses like making a phylogeny or using a snake make workflow to get the quick visualization. But eventually, if you have enough practice, you'll have the skills to do more complicated things. For instance, to satisfy the reviewers who want to see protein structures as well as variant analysis in that paper you submitted. And while it does take some effort to learn how to do these things, you're never completely alone because there are a lot of master chefs on the Anvio Slack that will be happy to give you advice or share their favorite recipes, or at least point you towards an online tutorial or some documentation. And like any good bioinformatics kitchen, if you bring the same data into Anvio four years later, later you, can bring, you can reproduce the same analysis as well as taking advantage of any recent upgrades as Marin recently bragged on Twitter. So that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you very much for listening and I'm looking forward to our discussion. And thank you so much to the organizers for, for putting this together. Awesome. So many exciting things. <laughs> All right, so now we've got plenty of time for your questions. Um, if you would like to ask Eva a question, you can use the raise hand feature if you'd like, and we will call on you to unmute yourself. Um, or if you just wanna pop them in the chat, you're more than welcome to do that as well. I see one from Beth, actually. Uh, she asks, what is your favorite tutorial for someone new to using command line? Um, it's been many, many years since I've done it myself, but one that I know many people are super happy with is I think Mike Lee's blog. Uh, his, I think it's called Happy Belly Bioinformatics. It's very adorable. And that's one I would highly recommend. I highly recommend that as well. Um, Jose. I was just curious if anyone was using Anvio in an undergraduate metagenomics class. Marin is, uh, at least he was when he was teaching here, and I TA'd for that course, and the undergraduates did very well with it. We just taught them some command line before the class started, and they took it and ran with it. It was great. So and, and very do, doable. do you have them install Anvio on their own laptops, or do you run it off of a server? Uh, we have them usually for that class install Anvio on their own laptops, but I, I know my colleague Florian Trigaday ran a workshop recently where they also had a server where people could use. So you could get in touch with him about that maybe. 
Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll ask on Slack. Great. Stephanie, do you want to go ahead with your question? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll also say to Jose that I teach undergrad classes and um, some of my undergrads are on here and they're using Anvio too. So um, we, they use this, my server to use it. But my question um, was, I was interested in the, the estimate metabolism function. And I, I was just wondering if you could talk more about that. Like if the, how does it look for metabolisms? Do you have to kind of select and choose metabolisms for it to look for, or is it lasting against some, how looking, yeah, I, yeah. How does it work? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the basic premise of software is that it takes the gene annotations in, in your sample and it matches them up against definitions of metabolic pathways. And according to how many of the annotations match, you'll get a completeness score basically of, of the pathway. And you can also now get copy numbers. Um, as to which pathways you can estimate for, by default, we use KEG because we had found a way to just automatically download the, the KEG database, the KEG modules uh, from their website. Uh, but as of like I guess, last December, there's also a way where you can make your own pathway. You could just define uh, a module like uh, pathway with annotations, not just from KEG, but also could be from like your own HMMs or from PFAMs or from NCI, NCBI COGS. And then you could give that set of user defined pathways to the program and it'll estimate for those. Hey, right, thank you. Absolutely. There's a question in the chat. Notice lots of visualizations were on the scale of tens to hundreds of samples. Have people had success with higher orders of magnitude, like thousands? Ooh. That is a lot. And I think that um, the visualization part, maybe not so much. I, like, I myself, I work with matrices of data that are often having thousands of samples. Um, and Ambu takes a very long time to visualize them. Although there have been recent improvements, uh, we, we hired a programmer last year, Matthew, who's working on the interface and he's amazing. He managed somehow to make it like 10 times faster at least. It was like many orders of magnitude. So it, I, I'm, I am trying it again recently with my big matrices and it's, it's working a lot better than it has before, but once you get up there, it's always a little bit difficult with graphical user interfaces. Although I would say that probably more of the command line stuff, if you don't need to visualize your data, would work a lot better with thousands of samples. Julia, you have a question? Yeah, I had a more technical question. I'm wondering if Anvio is working on any machine learning or like um, prediction algorithms that we might be able to see in the future. Um, not that I know of right now. I think there might have been one uh, machine learning algorithm that was put in there by Marin at some point that might be related to SCG taxonomy, so taxonomy, predicting taxonomy of a genome uh, based on single copy core genes, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, that I might be completely wrong on that. I remember him talking about a machine learning algorithm at one point, but if that said, if you have ideas for some that would be cool, just tell us and maybe we can work with you even to, to implement something like that. I think that'd be awesome. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Uh, recommendation on high throughput analysis from the assembly level, like recommendations on co-assembling FASTs from single assemblies. Um, I guess a general, I'm not really sure what you want to do, but a general recommendation I would have is if you're doing high throughput, you should use the stake make workflows like I showed in, in my slides, um, which would could help you assemble uh, a lot of co-assemble a lot of a lot of uh, rest of us. I hope that was enough. I know it's if you wanted to ask more specifics, you could always reach out. Yeah, I do have a question about the snake mate workflow. So I'm an Envio fangirl from like way back, like 2015. I do everything manually. Like I've got my steps, I've got my pipeline, my workflow. Um, I didn't realize there was a snake mate workflow. <laughs> could, could, could you explain like how that works? Am I saving myself a whole bunch of time by just using what you've already created? Yeah, you could be depending on what you do. Um, so we have a couple of predefined workflows, like the metagenomics one that I showed can go all the way from your just 
sequence files to co-assemble them or, or regular assemble them uh, all the way through to gene annotation and, and profiling in AMBIO, uh, which is the one that I think most of us use the most often. Um, we also have a pangenomics workflow so that if you don't want to run those three commands yourself, you can you can just do that. <laughs> um, yeah, but and you can make your own workflows if you know if you take some time to learn how Snakebake works and put the put the rules together, you could probably generate your own uh, config and, and and add it into Anthio. Um, but yeah, depending on on what you want to do, you could save yourself a lot of time because uh, really it's just a matter of turning on which rules, which programs you want to. Uh, what you want to see run in your samples, and then giving Ambio this this is the list of where my samples are, and when you, when you hit the workflow run program, uh, it will just go. Uh, especially works well with clusters because it can manage um, like how many jobs are sent to the cluster at the same time. So if you have your own uh, HPC compute cluster, mm -hmm. it would work very well with that. Oh wow, yeah, I definitely need to look into this. Um, okay, question in the chat: Are there any workflows for meta transcriptomics? Um, no, not at the moment. Uh, so what that being said, um, if you have metatranscriptomic samples, you can use the metagenomics workflow and just turn off the assembly stuff and do uh, what we call reference mode, which is where you give your, your reference genomes or metagenomes. And then you would also give the samples, so the metatranscriptomic samples. And it would all it would do is the read mapping. And then you would get out the set of profiles uh, that is showing the coverage of, of your reads in all of your references. Um, we don't have a built-in way to like normalize. Like uh, I know in, in, in transcriptomics, you need to, to make sure you normalize your, your coverage, but there's, there, I'm sure there's a, way, there's a way to like extract the coverage information from Ambio, which then you could plug into your own, uh, maybe like ad hoc script for normalizing those values. I was going to ask you about normalization because I used Ambio for metatranscriptomics mm -hmm. and yeah, it's a slog to normalize. Yeah, um, I know. We really should get around to just fixing something <laughs> for it. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Any other questions? This is a great discussion. general question about kind of your career path into helping be part of the Envio community, um, especially for our early career folks on here. Like, how did that all happen in terms of you joining in this effort and becoming like a core person that's helping with some of this stuff? And where do you see it going in the future? Um, yeah, absolutely. So I guess I will start from the very early days, which is when I was doing my undergrad because I sort of fell into this. I was so sure that I just wanted to do biology, like straight up wet lab work. Um, but sort of as a, as a backup, I decided to also do computer science as like sort of my additional major. Um, and when I was looking around for uh, a lab to join, I tried to join a wet lab group, but then they saw that I was doing computer science on the side and they were like, actually, you should join this bioinformatics group. So I said, okay. Um, and I joined there and that's where I, I got most of my basics in, it was a genomics lab. Um, and then when I realized I wanted to continue in this, I, I was looking around for who to, who to basically do my PhD with. And I, I found Marin at a conference, I believe, and came to talk to him. And he was basically like, this sounds like a great use of your skills though. You wanna code something for Anvio? And that's sort of how I, I got into this. Yeah. Great, thanks for that. I'm always curious how people end up in this field. <laughs> oh, Jose asked a question that I also had curiosity about. Um, I, don't if you, I don't know if you can see this question, or Jose, if you want to ask it live. Um, I didn't want to monopolize. <laughs> um, Eva, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about viruses and host predictions. Yeah. So. Um, I'm not sure we have host prediction built in for viruses in Ambio. Um, I do know that people have found viruses, especially when you know in when you're doing uh, binning for especially gut microbiome, you tend to see a lot of them. Um, they sort of just make their own little bins, and so people have found viruses and, and worked with viruses. Uh, but as for host prediction, I'm not sure we have anything implemented. Sorry. 
the one thing I would say is like a lot of the times when we do pangenomics with, uh, for instance, bacteria that have prophages, you, like the viral proteins will all end up in one gene cluster. So that is one way to find out if you have a prophage in, in your bacteria. But that's all I know, unfortunately. Another question, if you don't mind. You mentioned that um, this is not exclusive to uh, bacteria and archaea, that there are some uses of this for um, eukaryotes. I'm curious, like, what is the um, biggest hurdle, I would say, right? Because it's like genomes are generally bigger, there are all kinds of introns and stuff. Like, what, what is the biggest challenge for adapting Andio to the study of eukaryotes? Yeah, absolutely. Uh you are right in saying the introns are the, the biggest hurdle. Um, so the, the gene prediction software that we use uh, is Prodigal, which is designed for micro, uh, prokaryotic genomes mostly because it doesn't do any intron and exon prediction. That said, uh, there is a way to skip that step and then later import your own gene annotations into, um, into your, your context database. So as, as Joe is now saying in the chat, I can see. Um, so if you, if you take your, your eukaryotic genomes and you call genes on them outside of, of AMVO, you can then import those later. And I think that's how most people get around that. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other issues with, um, like for instance, working with multi-chromosomal organisms. Uh, or, I don't know if they, we would have a problem with the size because people are generally just using this for microbial work, but it has worked out. And if you want to work with eukaryotes, there's a lot of people on the Envio Slack who ask about this. Um, and if you just like look through those messages, you'll, you'll find the people that you will, you will want to ask about, uh, about doing this for, you, for their advice. Tom Delmon is, is one of them who, who does a lot of work with eukaryotes. Great. Any other questions from our audience? Well, if not, uh, then please join me in thanking our speaker for today for um, getting us excited on a Friday about bioinformatics and all the fun things that we can do with our data, um, and also um, uh, encouraging those of us who are shy <laughs> to work with bioinformatics that there's lots of tutorials and help out there for us. Um, uh, folks in this call who have worked with me and know that I actually don't do any of the bioinformatics from my group. Um, and so it's always nice to know that there's good entry points. Um, this recording, thank you for that question, Monique. Uh, yes, we are recording today's presentation. It will be posted on the CW website, darkenergybiosphere.org, which will be archived even though CW is sunsetting. Um, so it'll be available, we hope, in perpetuity. Um, uh, and as a reminder to anybody uh, who joined late, um, although this is the final CW webinar, um, the, our webinar experience uh, will not end. Uh, we're going to, the new COBRA program that is trying to connect deep sea scientists and all of us who care about microbes uh, with policymakers who are thinking about using the deep sea for various things, we're going to continue webinars through that platform. Cobra.bigelow.org is the place to go to find that and sign up for the newsletter. Um, and yeah, if we had 12 amazing webinars over the last year through this CW webinar series. Um, they're all, they're all that were recorded are on the website. Um, and wow, what a great time this has been. Thank you so much to Joy and Sajad and James, who's not with us today, and Rosalyn for keeping us all herded together in the right places. Um, and it's been a pleasure to meet everybody over the, the, these webinars. So thank you all so much. This has been great. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Eva, for your presentation. Thank you all for listening and for inviting me. It was a great time. <laughs>